So I want to, we're up to the second chapter here. I'm going to start with that stuff. And uh, then we will, I'll talk about the first few projects. So let me find my 152 lectures. And a student noticed that these lectures say they're 121, not 152. And that is true because I taught this in another class. I used these, this book in another class once a couple of years ago. So this is really 152, but the slides say 121. Anyway, so uh, a computer security incident is what we're going to respond to. And here are what the author regards as essential ingredients of this. Intent to cause harm performed by a person involving a computing resource. Um, so if somebody actually steals data, private data from your company, that's an incident. If they manage to steal money or extort money or get unauthorized access to resources or install malware, or install illegal things on your network. All of those are security incidents. Adding illegal things to your network is not losing your data, but it's certainly exposing your company to legal liability. It happened here. One of the labs we were in, uh, students were downloading illegal copies of the Harry Potter movies, and we got DMCA takedown notices. And so I went in that lab. I was the guy controlling that lab at the time, and I figured out how to lower the privileges of the users so they couldn't run BitTorrent anymore on there. Hey there. So anyway. So here's the goal of IR. There's investigate and then remediate. Um, investigate is the big job where you have to hunt through what happened and figure out how they got in, what they used, what they stole, and then whether it's still happening and uh, figure out how long, when you were hacked, how long you were hacked, what was stolen. And that's hard, but that's of course the thing you need to know. What harm has been done here? because they have to notify customers, regulatory agencies, and everybody else. And then you have remediate. You have to somehow stop it, kick them out, fix the problem, and now begin the process of uh, notifying people and apologizing and paying restitution or something. All that jazz. Is that what T-Mobile did? I don't know what T-Mobile did. I know they did get hacked. And uh, I think they were just recently admitted that they got hacked. And they tried to say that the passwords weren't in it. And then it came out two days ago that the passwords were, in fact, just Base64 followed by MD5 protected, which is almost the same as being plain text. But they're still trying to pretend they didn't lose passwords because they had some form of cryptography on them. Uh, this is what LinkedIn tried. LinkedIn's path, and you know, they had they had a form of hashing that wasn't much good. And uh, this is where the law is not so clear. But yeah, I mean, it's a. Uh, I mean, T-Mobile certainly did get breached recently, and I think they're still in the early stages of this process. Yeah? One thing you point to their advantage is just right now, I say, I don't got my password. Is it their, their advantage? Just to say. Uh, is it to their advantage to just lie? Yeah, just yes, well, they often do. Uh, LinkedIn certainly did for about a month. Um, it is very common. Well, of course, now, I don't really know what happened, but my personal belief is what goes on is you think you've been hacked, somebody outside your company says, I found some stuff on Pastebin, and your company doesn't know. So they ask somebody who's not really much of an expert, and they ask somebody, they say, all oh, that stuff is just fake. And so they start, probably a lot of them honestly believe they didn't really get hacked and it's just fake, because a lot of those breaches are fake. Hackers take an old thing from years ago and post it up and say they hacked somebody when they didn't. So to be, to be fair, they don't know right away. But this is why um, you have to investigate and decide what really happened. And then you have to be careful what you say. But it is very common. Uh, I'd say more than half the time, companies will say, uh, we had an intrusion, but they didn't get anything. And then next week, well, they got 100 accounts. And then next week, well, they got 1,000 accounts. And then next week, well, they got a million accounts. And next week, well, they still have root on the servers. You know, they, and, and it's partly that they don't want to admit anything bad, but it's also that they don't really know how bad it is. And so you have a natural conflict between telling the people what you have found and waiting until you actually know what you're saying. And there are just no simple answers. So what do the laws allow you to do if you know who actually hacked you? Oh, that's a very good question. This is why attribution is usually for the birds. Even if you prove who hacked you, so what? You can't go punch them in the face or send them a virus or steal their computers or even hack into their server and steal your data back legally. All that's illegal. The only thing you can do is hand it over to the cops or the FBI, and they can do that stuff. So, I mean, the FBI would like you to give them enough information so they can find out who hacked you. But as a company, it doesn't benefit you at all. This is another similar thing is like, find my iPhone. So someone steals your iPhone. You use that. You find out what house it's in. Now what are you going to do? Bust in and steal it back? That's not legal. 
That's why it's, the only point of Find My iPhone is in case you left it somewhere and it's just sitting in the park or under your sofa. If somebody stole it and you find its physical location, this doesn't really do you much good at all. And, the, and when this first came out, the people were sort of horrified to find out when you go to the cops and say, Find My iPhone says it's in there, kick down the door and take it. They say, no, I'm not doing that. This is, does not count. This does not constitute legal cause for me to kick down that door and take it. That's not probable cause if it's like... I think, um, I think it could be considered probable cause. Then they could go to court and get a search warrant. Then they could execute a search warrant. And all that is too much bother. It's because there's too many of them being stolen. It's like a bicycle theft. You can file a report, but they're not going to do anything because it's not important enough. Uh, that's, that's my understanding. It'd be nice to have a, a police representative give more informed answers about these things. But, you know, I know, um, anyway, so there's a lot of people involved. There's the main investigation team, and now they have to talk to the legal people to find out what the law requires and your compliance people to see what your compliance <coughs> regulations for your industry require. And your human resources are going to answer questions like, what do you tell your staff? And should you be firing or punishing the staff that did the bad thing? And you've got your infrastructure team and your business managers and your IT support. All these people need to know what's going on. Um, when there was a fake breach at the college about six years ago from our cook and chief technology officer that hired a crony of his to do a, attach a fake network forensic compliance to the network and then claim that we had viruses on all the machines. So they had to pay him a ton of money to detect them, although he didn't even pretend to clean them. This went on for about a year, but the first thing he did was go to the San Francisco Chronicle and bring a reporter from them on campus to take pictures of the labs and put it in the newspaper without telling anybody on campus because the goal was not to fix a problem. The goal was to make him famous as the savior of us when we were too stupid to detect the problem. And you know, this is why you never do this because what happened is everybody the next day didn't know what to do. The front page of the Chronicle said San Francisco Network had the biggest hack in history. And everybody came, they called me, they called the help desk, they called the IT, all of us said, I have no idea what this is about. Everybody said, is it safe to use the computer? Do I need to change my password? Do I need a new credit card number? And nobody had any idea what to tell them. So you don't want to let that happen. You have to tell everybody what to say. And you can tell what they're all going to ask. They're all going to say, what does this mean for me? Is it safe to use my computer? Do I need a new password? Do I need a new credit card? Um, is it, has whatever it is spread to my home machine, on my phone? You should be able, you should anticipate those things and give and tell these people what they're supposed to say. Or you will just have a lot of chaos. So the incident manager runs the team and this person has to be very high in the management because they have to have the power to uh, make difficult, expensive business decisions like shutting down servers, uh, stopping business functions, diverting significant amounts of staff to handling the incident instead of running normal business and stuff like that. So it can't just be one angry guy that believes in security. It has to be a high-level executive who has the right to do those things. And so that's, then you've got an IT staff person here, of course, because they're going to have to actually understand the servers and the firewalls and everything and how to actually perform your uh, analysis and uh, remediation steps and then to help design the changes that will improve your posture to stop it from happening again. And here's your ancillary teams. You've got compliance teams and legal teams and all these other people like human resource and ultimately public relations involved in handling the incident and handling all the uh, disclosures of the incident here and there. When RSA got hacked about eight years ago, RSA is the main provider of two-factor authentication for the US military and all the major corporations like insurance companies. So everybody carries these RSA tokens that cost 30 bucks each, and they use that as the second factor along with their password to log into systems. And it is apparently true, although never officially admitted, that RSA kept on their servers a master key that could predict all the numbers of all those tokens because the government of China made them a high priority target, and they hacked into RSA, and they stole something from RSA, which RSA never disclosed. But after that, they attacked Lockheed Martin, and the official statement after it was over was to say that China failed to get into Lockheed Martin. And I think most security professionals believe what happened is they did get in and take whatever they want. And they felt obligated to lie about it after the fact, which is normal. You typically never can admit that a military attack succeeded because you do not want the enemy to know that they found good stuff. You want to then make them believe that they found fake stuff or something. There's more stuff they didn't find. So you lie even if they did get in. But anyway. Um, 
but RSA never, never told anybody what the Chinese stole from them. But what they did say is, we will replace all the hardware of any of our customers for free if you sign a non-disclosure agreement to never tell anybody what we tell you. And several companies did that, and that is an enormous amount of money. They have you know, 100,000 employees at 30 bucks each. They replaced all the hardware for free and told them in secrecy what happened. So it seems obvious that there must have been a master key which they stole. And that's, anyway, um, this kind of thing happens all the time. And it's an interesting example because they, they had to make decisions how to release information. And what they chose was to tell the public at large only something very vague. There was an attack, somebody clicked on an attachment, somebody got in the systems, and the details are confidential. And then they made this non-disclosure agreement so they could tell their important customers more details, but only in secrecy. And this is, the, uh, this is what that voting machine guy is saying. He's saying, you know, there's a part of security that the DEF CON community doesn't get, which is keeping secrets and having confidential proprietary stuff. You shouldn't just let everybody see the voting machines. They don't want you to have a copy to play with. They want to keep it secret. And the military typically tries to have strong encryption and strong systems and also keep it all secret. So you can't get one to practice on that's regarded as another layer of security. And the open source community very much doesn't like that secrecy stuff. They say you should just publish everything and make it so strong that even when you know everything, you can't get in. And, you know, both, both sides are out there. But in the corporation legal world, you do have to be very careful what you say. It affects your stock price. And another thing is if you go making a public statement about the breach, you might very well be confessing to a crime. And so you really have to run it by lawyers and everything to say what exactly should we be saying about this. And another issue is there are other agencies out there now, like PCI DSS. PCI DSS is not a law. It is industry self-regulation. Now, the credit card companies have so far avoided being regulated by the government in America. And the way they have done it is they have formed this group, which is a consolidation of several credit card companies, and they make their own security rules. And they enforce their own security rules. And their agenda is to make it practical for a lot of people to use credit cards and also to provide enough security so that the government doesn't get angry enough to come down and regulate them with government laws. So they've got their own organization to protect. And they might very well be more interested in protecting their reputation than dealing with your company's problems. They might be willing to throw your company under the bus to preserve their own reputation. So it's, it's an issue. You know, they're a stakeholder that may have a different goal than your incident response team. And so a lot of people hire consultants because they don't have anybody on their staff that knows anything about incident response. Um, and the book is, of course, written by the number one source of consultants, the Mandiant Corporation that does all this. And yet they say you would be a lot better off if you had some, some IR skills on your own team because the outer, external people really don't understand your network so well. But most people do hire consultants, and they're not cheap. But you know, if you, uh, the odds are very good that if you don't hire a consultant, you will not even successfully find all the attacks and get even eject the bad guys. So anyway, that's the game. Um, you can look for these things. And a lot of companies are quite used to outsourcing things. Uh, one of the jobs, as you move in a security uh, career, you start as an analyst or you're just doing some low-level work. And one of the early jobs a lot of people take is a security uh, consultant. And they will just fly to a new corporation every week they will pay for you to get tons and tons of certifications because they love all those things. And you'll learn everything. You go to every different company every week with a team. And, and after a while, you see how much they're all the same. And now you can come in with, you've seen it all before. You pretty much know what's wrong. And that's why they pay you the big bucks because you can swoop into their network and usually find the problem pretty fast because there really are, you know, 15 or 20 common suites people use. And after you've seen them a couple times, you pretty much know what's going on. So you find candidates, look for people who know incident response, are already working on other teams. Uh, you might find some college programs that teach them something useful, but there aren't very many of them. And uh, they typically expect you to be postgraduate uh, because most colleges regard all this security training as grad work. They won't teach any of this to undergraduates, um, just basic computer literacy for undergraduates. And they think you need a master's degree to do this stuff. And another issue, of course, for corporate work is they would like you to be mature and responsible and dress properly and talk carefully and not embarrass them, which is, you know, that's the problem with the sort of drunken teenage hacker thing that you see. So like Steve was telling me, the guys that show up at the job fair in a suit get jobs. The other people largely don't. And, you know, you might be rebelling against that, but that's the way it is. And so 
You look for things, experience is the main thing. Experience in computer forensics, running investigations, and network traffic for your network analysis, and the applications relevant to your organization. If you're a Java shop running Apache and Tomcat, or one of these things like, uh, there's a bunch of these goofy things like Magneto and stuff that people use, and struts and all that jazz, and you really have to know them to, to uh, keep them up. That's one thing I like about the Wall of Sheep and the Capture the Flag at DEF CON, that stuff is all enterprise level stuff. It's funny, I'm there with teachers at the Wall of Sheep and we have this packets flowing and people are investigating it with Wireshark and stuff and finding stuff and it kept on crashing because it was a huge Apache Tomcat application and the server couldn't really run. And the other teachers at this level and I were saying, you know, I could just write a bash script that would send out the packets and it would be good enough. But the official application has like 500 different series of packets and a complicated scoring system and it's it's the huge enterprise class because that's how the guy thinks. It's a commercial product he's selling to the military. And you know, you, you do get exposure to this. The kind of stuff you do on one little machine with Apache and stuff is for amateurs. The pros use Java and Tomcat and server clusters and big complicated systems that can serve a lot of people. And it's a whole other world. So it's good to get exposure to it. And that's, that's what they're referring to down here. Um, everything. If you actually get into Cisco, take the Cisco certification, and start putting new versions of Cisco IOS on hardware, it is fantastically complicated. You have to read through long, complicated technical specifications to find out if it will even run on your hardware. It is much, much more complicated than patching something like Windows or Linux, and you have to get used to that. I went to um, the CPTC in Rochester, and IBM was there, and IBM was running their new intrusion detection system, QRadar, and that thing was awesome. It would totally understand every attack and explain it in English in real time and have beautiful graphs. And I said, that's great. And they said, oh, there's a free version. So I came and tried to run the free version, and the free version doesn't do anything. It won't even run. It just makes you cry. You really have to have a $1 million server to run it before it does all that cool stuff. And they think nothing of that because they're enterprise class stuff. So, you know, there is a whole world of large-scale computing that you don't see in our little labs here, and that's why we're trying to increase our industry partnerships and the internships so you can get a look at the big, big toys, because it's quite a different level up there. Anyway, so uh, your, your team members should be analytical with a good attention to detail and so on, and the main thing they have to do is a structured approach to problem solving. Um, one of my best forensics classes I took years ago was from Steve Haley, who is the official forensic investigator for the Washington State Teachers Union. And he had a lot of case histories, and we went to his lab, and he installed in case, an FTK, and I think it was in case, had a feature that will tell you the MAC address of the server from which you downloaded a file. Because when you download a file on Windows, there is a shortcut in the recent files directory, and the shortcut has the MAC address of the server in it. And I looked at that MAC address, and it was not equal to the MAC address of the real server. And I was upset, and he had to leave, and we stayed until he liked 8 p.m. figuring it out, and this is what you gotta do, you get to the bottom of it, and we figured it all out. The, I thought it would get that MAC address from the layer two information of the packets that came from the server, because I think in terms of network analysis and Wireshark, but that is not how Windows software works. Windows software runs at layer seven, it has no access to the addresses. What it does is send a WMI query to the server, to find the address, and it answers the copy of the address in the registry. So the server had multiple network cards, of which only one was connected. But when they boot up, it loads them in the registry, and the last one that goes in happens to be one that's not connected, and that is the official MAC address of the server, which it will answer WMI queries with. You know, it's the kind of thing, in this, when, you, when you find evidence on a machine, you really have to get down to the details to figure out what it means. It is very easy to have false conclusions. Uh, there was one of uh, Steve's students that accused the teacher of watching pornography in class, that he found all these URLs, and it was a month later when Steve went over it, he could find out that what was going on was there was an anti-malware product installed on that machine, and those URLs were the list of URLs it was blocking. It's not that a teacher went to those URLs, quite the opposite. But you know, you, you'll find them on the machine, and now you jump to a conclusion of how they got there. You really have to get down to the bottom of it. So industry certifications are good. Um, some people have a million certs because they're just cheating on the test or something. But you know, certs plus education plus experience, there should be some kind of balance there. Um, and I got some cahoots here. And there might be enough people here to justify this. I brought some prizes. <laughs> I went to DEF CON 
<laughs> and I saw these things, and I said, I gotta have those. So today my stuff came in. So blockchain. Uh. I have blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> so if you get the most right, you will get a blockchain, which you may pass on to someone if you don't like it, but I think it's great, personally. Right. Yeah, what, how much do you think those are worth? <laughs> well, you have to win cahoots to get them. They're otherwise priceless. They were selling them at DEF CON, but they kept running out. So when I came back, I how found... How much was it? Oh, I, I don't know. I heard, they were all sold out. But I, I came back and figured out how hard would it be to get the, the pieces and make my own, and it wasn't that hard. So. <laughs> I made my own blockchains. If you don't have a Canvas account, send an email to... I'll put it out there. I'm glad you reminded me. They just set it up yourself. Right. It's an external account. It's not the City College Canvas. All right. So what stakers may have other goals more important than your company's recovery? All right. And that's PCI. or an agency outside you that may have other concerns. What's the most important ability of the incident manager? All right. Authority what matters. They have to have the power to expend resources and allocate tasks to people. All right, which of these is not a computer security incident? Yeah, that's it. The, the employee that got caught doing a bad thing is not a security incident because they did not succeed in doing the bad thing. It's just an HR event where somebody did a bad thing and now they'll be punished, but you're, it doesn't even imply there's anything wrong with your procedures. Apparently your procedures are successfully stopping that. All right. So which of these is not a goal of IR, commonly? We've been here, unless you're the law enforcement, the identity doesn't really matter to you. So, make a note, we got Melanson <laughs> and Jeff Tom. All right, Jeff Tom is in the room, he gets a blockchain. Pass him a blockchain. The process is here, there's three, three steps. First, you have your initial response. All right, so your initial response is assembling the team, assigning roles, and so on. Let me try and get this junk off my screen, okay. Uh, now you, you have to assess whatever you can get your hands on quickly. Interview the people that reported it, see what they say, because you're first trying to decide if you have an incident, and if so, sort of how big it is. It's just like police, you know, somebody calls and says something bad is happening, you show up and try to assemble quickly, what have we got here, in general terms. Um, so you interview the people, who reported it, interview the staff that might have seen something in a log or otherwise know something, business unit people who might know something, take a look at the logs that appear to be relevant, and document everything because this is going to be the starting point for an investigation. Now most computer forensics comes later and we would always start for an incident report like this that will list things like what happened and though typically for hard disk type forensics you look for keywords the name of the person doing the bad thing, the name of the application used, and now you know what words to look for on the disk to try to find further evidence about it. So the documentation is really important. Then investigation is the big job. So now you're trying to really find out what happened, how it happened, maybe who did it, and you don't want to just start doing correction activities without understanding this. You're likely to just make things worse. It's what you do, you get your initial leads from the initial report, someone declares an incident, and you get some general idea of what the obvious symptoms are here, and now you go in a loop. You create indicators of compromise from the information you have. Like I was saying, you might find the name of a person, an email account, an IP address, or something that gives you some idea how to detect what's involved in the incident. Then you deploy the IOCs, which means you send some kind of script out on the network which queries the machines to see if they have the indicators of compromise that you know about. Registry keys, files, network traffic or something. Then you find the systems of interest and you analyze them more to see what's going on on those systems and from that you find more IOCs. Because you go to the machines, find something like more malware, another compromised account or something, and then you, have, and you go around a circle here um, deploying IOCs to find more systems, finding those systems to find more IOCs. This is exactly the process that I was taught to use for hard disk forensics. You start from some keywords, you search for them and find more keywords, you keep going until you're not finding any new keywords, and then you call it done. This is a common technique used in science. There are some scientific uh, processes like uh, Newtonian mechanics where you can actually solve the problem, but there's a lot of scientific problems that are too difficult to solve, and so you cannot really get the right answer, so what you do is you get what's called a stable answer. You do some process of excessive approximation, and you stop when it stops changing. And that might not be the right answer, but you know you're wasting your time continuing this way, so you call it a solution and go on. And in 
investigations, that's about all you can ever do. You're never going to be perfect about anything. And you do have to be relatively speedy. You can't just be wasting a lot of time because this is all costing you a lot of money. All during this time, a bunch of your staff is doing this instead of working, and they are probably making services unavailable to customers and otherwise costing you money. So you can't just waste extra time doing this to be perfect. But you do have to wait to remediate until you think you have found everything that must be removed. If there are 10 viruses deployed and you only find five of them and clean them off, you're not getting anywhere because the bad guy will know you're onto them and they'll use the five remaining viruses to dig in deeper. So uh, getting more information is better. It reminds me a lot of neurosurgery. I used to do brain modeling, and we, uh, one of the labs, not mine, but the other studied epilepsy patients, because if you have epilepsy, they cure it by removing part of your brain that's causing these storms. And there's a contest. The surgeon wants to remove more brain matter to get rid of the epilepsy, but the rehabilitation person wants him to remove less brain matter to make it easier for the person to rehabilitate later and they have to reach a compromise there. So you get your initial leads. Uh, malware is not the only issue. You look for what you can find, although malware is often part of it. So you try to find leads that are relevant to the incident, detailed and actionable. So you want something that gives you an indicator of compromise that you can find quickly on the network, not something baffling and confusing. And so those are your indicator of compromise, things like directories, file names, uh, events in the event log, persistence mechanism like registry keys or startup scripts. IP addresses, domain names, malware signatures, things that you can quickly detect. Yeah? How do you know uh, what's malware and what's not malware? Well, that's a hard thing. The question of what's malware and what's not malware, and this is actually part of why computer laws are so terrible, because the law would have to have a clear definition, and it's very hard to make a definition. Um, on, I, from a company point of view, it's a judgment call of things that you regard as harmful to the business. And there's a whole lot of things in the middle, like if people install BitTorrent so they can download movies, they think that's a good thing. The company thinks that's a bad thing. So I don't know if you'd call it malware, but your company wants to get rid of it. And the same, there's a lot of tools that are kind of in the middle, like Windows Update, especially these days. Windows Update could easily be considered malware. Um, it's tough. So the indicators of compromise are, this, is, this whole process is fairly new and it's in what you'd think of as like a beta test phase. So right now we don't even have a way of writing down indicators of compromise. There are several competing standards, none of them accepted. Mantient has theirs, OpenIOC. Yara is very common. And I'm gonna have a project where you make Yara rules and use Yara. Yara is a product that will, it, it's essentially the um, malware version of Splunk. And I'm gonna have some Splunk projects too. Splunk is the standard for network signatures. It's been out there long enough, it has set the rules. If you want to detect some kind of network attack, you write a Splunk signature and there's a standard syntax for it and everybody agrees and everybody that writes any kind of intrusion detection system accepts Splunk signatures. And Yara is as close as you get to that for detecting malware on systems. Um, but Yara is actually very limited. Yara just looks for a specific pattern of bytes in the file. It doesn't even unzip zipped files and open packed files, so it's extremely easy to slip malware past Yara. It only does the most surface analysis of files. But anyway, we will use this It's a standard. These other ones have not become so popular yet. I'm going to focus on Yara. Um, so I'm working on a project. It'll probably take me another week or two to get that up. All right. And so here's an example indicator of compromise in a, an IOC um, XML format. So this is one, it's going to have, this is Mandiant's format. So it's got these XML things. And so here it's got kernel32.dil as a file item full path. Here's another file item. These are files. Here's some kind of event. Here's another uh, file name. This is a process item. So that's what you have, you know, the process in RAM with this name, an event in the event log with uh, number, which I don't see here, that sort of thing. All it is is a standard way of explaining the usual things, registry keys, running processes, file names, and so on. But you have to have some kind of standard format so an automated tool can read them all and then scan your machine quickly to see if it's there. Mandiant makes a tool called Redline, which you'll see talked about a lot in the book. The first time I taught this class, I tried to use it. It seems to me to be complete garbage. It runs for hours and finds nothing. I don't understand why they even make it. So. As far as I can tell, just write your own scripts is the right way to do it. So that's what we're going to do unless I find a tool that actually works. Although on one machine, Yara works pretty well. So we're going to see. I, I don't know. There is a third-party product called um, LogMD. Some guy grabbed me at B-Sides and told me about it. It looks very simple. Maybe it works. I'm going to try that. I'm getting a key for it. But um, 
Red line, as far as I can tell, is useless. I, or there's some way to use it I can't figure out. Anyway, so you, uh, you find them in some automated fashion, and you just have to write some kind of script. And in a Windows environment, typically WMI is what you use. We can uh, have some projects where you go through this. Windows Management Instrumentation lets you send a query over a Windows network and get information about the operating system from the other end. And it has a Microsoft DOS-looking syntax. You can do WNI queries to get information from a machine, and that's typically how you do it. And you can, of course, put it in any language you want, like Visual Basic or Python or something, but you wouldn't use Python in a Windows environment because it's not a native Windows product and it'll never work very well. You want to stick with the native Windows stuff, and that would be Visual Basic or WMI. These days, probably PowerShell. And there may be a PowerShell version of this stuff. I'm going to look around and see what we've got. So snort rules, like I say, are the standard on network signatures. Snort is very old, I think 15 years old, so it has become the standard way to specify network traffic patterns. Uh, there is no clear leader yet in the file forensic land. So you deploy your ind indicators of compromise, you run some kind of tool that sends queries over the network to ask every machine, do you have these various items, files and registry keys and such, and then you get hits. Hits are machines that have some of your indicators of compromise and are therefore potentially part of the attack. And now you have to go and try to evaluate your hits because, of course, your rules are not perfect. It might be that some of those machines have an indicator of compromise, but it doesn't really mean they're part of the attack because your indicator of compromise is not precise enough and it detects something like a file that might have been put there by some other process. So um, just like your antivirus scanner and everything else, you're going to have to analyze and refine your rules. And then, so you, you validate these things. Uh, that's why one of the very important things is to choose a time frame. Uh, I'll go through a case history of a server I cleaned up a, a month ago, and it was very helpful to find the time frame. I figured out the moment when it got hacked, and therefore I could ignore all the events before that time, and that's important in all kinds of forensics, including hard drive forensics. Uh, then you assign them to categories. You have backdoor installed, access with valid credentials, SQL injection, credential harvesting. These are common steps. First, you install some kind of malware. You get non-privileged access. Then they do something like steal password hashes or something and get privileged access. Then eventually, they steal real valid credentials like VPN passwords. And after that, it's really hard to detect them anymore. <laughs> that's the game. But of course, that's why they do that. After, then they're impersonating your real users and they're not setting off alarms anymore, so you've got to look for which real users have been compromised. So if you have a lot of information, you try to find the one that will appear to advance your investigation the most. And we are trying to preserve evidence. Now, in criminal forensics, which is what the 121 course is about, it's all about keeping a perfect copy of the evidence because you're going to go to court. And that evidence is going to go to the prosecution and defense, and it's going to be an evidence item, and they're going to argue and lock people up based on it. So you have a big deal of taking a whole image of the drive and putting a hash value on it and storing the original as safe and making sure it's all perfect. But in instant response, you don't really care about that level of perfection because you're not really planning to go to court and prosecute. You're just trying to find it and clean it up. But you do want to um, find the evidence on the machine. So you, you want to not burden the machines any more than necessary. You don't want to use any tool that takes too long. And you want to quickly get the answer. But it's not particularly that you're trying to preserve the system because we're doing live forensics. We're taking data from a running system, so it's constantly changing. So there's no perfection at any level. It's not true that when you redeploy the tool, you'll get exactly the same answer. And it's not like there's some kind of hash representing the state of the system that will be reproducible later. It's changing. So um, you're just trying to collect evidence in a quick way. And you don't bother with anything that's going to give you large vials of evidence that you don't have time to examine. So if you think about those people that stole credit card numbers from what looked like Target, they really showed you how to do it. You don't download the whole hard drive from the system. Don't download all the RAM. You find one process and take the RAM from one system, and then you analyze it until you find where the credit card numbers are. And then you write something that will just steal the credit card numbers and nothing else and send you that. Now, that's efficient for the criminals, and we want the same kind of efficiency. We want a tool that will tell us what we need to know and not waste our time with a pile of irrelevant information. And that's live response. This is normally what you do. Your network is running. You are not turning things off. You're just sending queries over the network and finding out what's going on. And this contains a hard disk information, like files that's non-volatile and volatile information, things in RAM and uh, so on. So let me go up here and see what this chat message is. The target breach, well, yes, they, my, I, I of course do not say so, but my opinion is the target breach was case one. 
that's certainly what it looked like to me. All right, so um, then you got memory collection. You can copy, your first few projects, you're gonna get RAM images and analyze them, and you'll see they're pretty nice, but they tend to be too big. Uh, more targeted memory uh, captures from just one process is easier, but we'll see this. So capturing all the memory is too much bother, just like capturing all the hard drive is too much, but it's the first step, and later on you refine your procedures to be less clumsy. Forensic disk image is the original old-fashioned forensic from a decade ago or more. This is all you used to do back in the days of Windows 98. Your first step was kick the plug out, turn off the power abnormally, then image the hard drive, and that was it. Anything in RAM was considered useless because, in the first place, it's not perfect, and you can't, it might be altered by your investigation techniques, so it was considered not admissible in court. And the other, more important reason, which also affects us, is that objects in RAM do not have creation dates, and they do not have owners. So if you find something in RAM, you really do not know when it was put there or who put it there. So from the viewpoint of prosecuting somebody, it's essentially useless. And it was very instructive to me when we had that course I was describing here in our lab. We had a brand new lab with brand new hardware. And we all analyzed the RAM from those machines. And they found an email that I had written to my sister in that lab three years earlier on the previous generation of hardware. And uh, what happened is, apparently, the technician chose that particular machine that I had used to make the image that was then ghosted onto those machines. And this is a fun fact about Windows. Windows, when you boot up, it copies the page file back into RAM, putting old stuff back into RAM. So if you use a machine, the stuff you put on it persists amazingly far into the future. And so when you find it there, you don't know where that came from. That could have come from something years ago not the original attack, and that's, that's an issue. That's why RAM is very touchy stuff. Anyway, so that's the game here. A whole hard drive image is something you would avoid as much as possible because it's 500 gigabytes of stuff. That'll take you a week to wade through. Uh, it's very hard to believe you really need to do that. Um, if you do, you're only gonna pick one or two systems to do that to, and you better have a good reason because that's an awful lot of work. And of course, if you're really trying to prosecute somebody for doing a computer crime on that one system, that's where it came from. That is how you do it. But um, the end result is, by the way, the same thing happens to the cops. Every time there's a crime scene, they impound all the computing devices. And these days, it's a laptop, a desktop, three cell phones, an iPad, uh, two iPods, five digital cameras. And the evidence departments are incredibly backlogged with all this junk to sift through. <laughs> it is a huge problem. An average crime scene has 1,000, 10,000 gigabytes of stuff, only a tiny amount of which is actually relevant, but somebody has to dig through all that stuff trying to find it, and it's a problem. So malware analysis is one big step. You run some kind of scanner to see if they're malware. This is live response we've talked about, where you send queries to look for specific things. Then you've got forensic examination of RAM or disk, which is expensive, but it is, of course, the most perfect. Let me check my chat messages. Is it usually time-saking to image mobile phones via dumps? It is not equally time-saking, but it's still a big time. And we will be doing some mobile forensics. Uh, the mobile systems um, that we're going to use are Android, because iPhones are very hard to image these days. And Android is just like Linux. And it's just like a small Linux, but it's still a lot of data. It's a lot less data than a whole Windows machine or a whole Linux desktop, though. We'll play with it so you can see it. You see how to image phones and how to analyze the data, because that's important. And, but the same thing applies. You would not want an image of all the data on a phone either. You would rather just do a query to get to specific items. All right, so then, you, yeah. Would it be useful just to go to the garbage can and start to analyze? Uh, yes, certainly. Going to the garbage can is good. This is actually a, a common feature of criminal forensics. Um, the bad guy often finds out you're coming and deletes the files, and most people don't know how to delete files. So all this does is put a flag on and make them easy to find. Because unless you actually use a shredder program, Throwing them in the trash can doesn't do anything, except make it obvious that you're trying to hide that. So yeah, that's certainly an option. Looking at, if you're dealing with a human who is doing a bad thing and they're trying to cover their tracks, then a trash can would be a place to look. These kind of intrusions are often not that way, but that's, that's right, that's a, that's a good point. Anyway, so you when you are not finding anything new with your detection, then it would be a logical time to remediate. You say, well, we found all the, the attacks we can find, so let's try and stop this out, then you plan but you hopefully have been planning your remediation all along, so you've been figuring out what you would have to do to remove all the threats that you have discovered. And, uh, all right, I've got a Kahoot here. Uh, okay, which phase of IR interviews the person who reported the incident? Uh, 
All right, that's the initial response. Um, by the way, I'm going to interrupt this for a minute to point out, if you do not have a account on Canvas, then... On Open what, Canvas, is more like a... Yeah, on the Canvas I'm using, then what you should do is email and ask for one, and I wanted to make sure and announce this in every class. I, I just made it myself. So I just send it. Started. Well, I don't... Anyway, go I to... Got in. All right, cnet.152, sam, at gmail. My grader is on top of this, so it will be done efficiently. Email that address to get a Canvas account. You can do it yourself. If you figure out how to do it yourself, that's fine. But if you email that address, we'll make one for you. And uh, I should have put that in the first day, and I'm glad I was able to remember to do it now. And the email is there for that reason. So if you're lost, you can email that. We'll make an account and send you links to what you need. Anyway, good? All right. And so which phase makes forensic analysis of disk images? All right, that's of course part of the investigation. It's just kind of an ugly hard work part, but it's part of it. All right, what phase would include re-imaging the servers? All right, that's remediation, of course. You're actually fixing the damage. All right, where would you deploy IOCs? All right, that's part of the circular process of investigation. You deploy IOCs. If you analyze those machines and find more IOCs, you deploy them, you find more, and you keep going until you're not finding any more. That is the investigation loop. All right, so M dot. I know who that is, and I don't certainly don't know who that funny symbol is, or echo. <laughs> echo and funny symbol. All right, those people will have to tell me who they are, but M dot, it's a blockchain. All right, let's do the last bit of this. So here's the three activities. You have posturing, tactical activities, and strategic activities to deal with your incident. And um, let me try and get this thing to go up off the screen. Sounds like a Star Trek episode. Yeah, well, these, these are all imitations of military terms. So posturing is what you do to um, establish, a, set up your company in such a way that you have a chance of accomplishing remediation. So you have protocols to communicate between people. You have clear responsibilities, a chain of command. You have um, enough resources, and you have scheduled resources and timelines so people can talk. If you do all this, then you have more chance of success. This is preparatory information. It's just That's what they call it, being set up so you're ready to handle issues. And then there's tactical. This is the standard military stuff. Tactics are winning the current battle, and strategies are winning the war. So tactics are what you're doing to fix the immediate problem, rebuilding the systems, changing passwords, blocking IP, telling customers, making announcements as needed, changing a business process um, so that this can't happen again. So maybe there's another firewall to go through or another person have to sign off on something before a system is changed or something like that so that this particular thing can't happen the same way again. And then there's strategic improvements which are long-term changes in the organization to make you more secure so this whole category of attacker won't be able to get in again. Um, like maybe you want to have automated scanning to make sure that all your systems are updated properly or you know, other things like that or outsource part of your security to a cloud service that will do a better job of keeping bad stuff away from your network or something like that, which may take a year or two to implement. But it, or you know, switch from Windows to Linux or something like that drastic that will really change your threat posture, but it's going to take time. All right, and you have to track all your information and you have to somehow share it. I know our competition teams are suffering from this. When they're doing CPTC, you're taking over maybe 10 machines, you've got Windows and Linux and they're all in an environment, and they have a huge problem finding a tool whereby you can somehow share all the information. Um, it would be nice if they could all run one node or something, but they can't, and so it's actually turning out to be a big problem. How do you get all the information from all the boxes in one place and then to all the team members efficiently so they know what's going on? And you have to do that, and that is one of the logistic challenges of the competition team. And the competition team in this regard is correctly simulating a real instant response process. You have the same issue here. People are running around doing things, and if you don't have a good system of them all logging everything they do in some kind of central document, then somebody finds something really important, and they don't put it in a document, and the people that need to know don't find out quickly. Or worse, they do something which some other part of the team knows is the wrong thing to do, but since they're not communicating, they don't get that information. <laughs> All right. So you have to have some kind of system of naming things and a list. Uh, in the world of hard disk forensics, there's these uh, 
standard reports people use to report computer forensic findings and so on. They come from the tools like in case. And in the instant response world, these things are more in their infancy. But you have to have some kind of organized spreadsheet or database or something where you record all this information with who found it, date, time, source, list of the systems, list of the indicators of compromise you went to, what data was stolen. So that then at the end, you can do something like a query quickly to find out, I found something strange on this one. Did somebody find that on another machine earlier? I should be able to answer that question quickly because it's all going in one central place where I can search for a keyword or something. Uh, you list any attacker activity that's important, all the IOCs you find, network and host based, list of compromised accounts. That's of course super important because all those compromised accounts are now going to look like legitimate traffic, but they probably aren't legitimate traffic anymore. And uh, a list of all the tasks that must be done now as you find things that need to be fixed later. Because of course you're going to find a lot of things that need to be fixed later, but they're not necessary right now to put the fire out. And you have to put them someplace so they can be found later to be cleaned up at the appropriate time. And your main goal here is to produce a report. Now, this is your fundamental deliverable. If you're a consultant, you make a good formal report and you make a series of progress reports as you go ahead. And that is what makes why they like you as professionals to make good reports, to make it clear so people know what's happening. Uh, then they will, it makes you more organized and it makes your customer appreciate you more that you're making good professional reports, you're not just like hackers running loose in the system doing stuff and not telling me what you're doing. Um, that's what makes you feel like they're getting value for their money. So I got one more set of cahoots, and then I'm gonna demonstrate the third project. That's my plan. So who should not be getting reports of your investigation? There you see, this is this was my problem with our chief technology officer. Going straight to the paper, I said, wait a minute. I don't even need to talk about whether his tool is any good. That's nuts. And I don't think it takes a genius to say, this is not the correct instant response plan to go straight to the paper. <laughs> that can't be the right first move. Now this is a false response. Yeah, but that's like a suicide move. That's being a whistleblower where you know you're going to get fired and go to lawsuits and all that jazz. That's what you do when all else fails. That's not the first move. Anyway. All right. Anyway, so um, what remediation phase includes changing passwords? So this is tactical, changing passwords. All right. It stops the immediate intrusion. So what's the fast, easiest, and most common type of data collection? OK, that's live response. Good. And which phase includes designating responsibilities? All right, that's posturing. So you're ready to deal with an instant response. So Echo, who is an online person, one, and therefore will not get the, the blockchain. Jeff Tom is therefore gets the other one. And Dan, who is Dan in the room? Well, then you get it, okay. Uh, Dan. <laughs> yes, you'll get a blockchain and I'll need your last name. But let me make a note. Jeff Tom is now one twice and Echo is one twice. <laughs> All right. And so I just want to demonstrate, yes, yeah, so good, you went back there. Now I want to um, demonstrate the third project. That's the only other thing on the agenda today. So let me bring up my Windows machine, and I'm going to stop the Zoom share because we don't need it anymore. You folks can watch the City College share, which is higher quality anyway. So here is my Windows machine. And I've gone back and forth on the details of this project. And the latest version I put out, uh, I'm, I went back to limiting the RAM. Um, it turns out that Server 2016 runs very well with very low amount of RAM, which is common for Microsoft Windows Server products. They make them so they can run on very weak hardware. Usually you do run them on very beefy hardware, but they will run on weak hardware um, for testing purposes and such. And in this case, making a small image is faster and easier, especially for Project 4. Anyway, so the point here is we're going to get an image of the entire RAM and take a quick look at it. Uh, when I first wrote this project, I used the old Windows Server 2008 machine, and the RAM image is more interesting in 2008 because the programs at that time were incredibly sloppy. In fact, one thing that they did back then was you could just take the passwords for all your web accounts right out of RAM. I did it on stage at Hope years ago. I was horrified. All the browsers just put your password in RAM and leave them there. And that is no longer true. I tried it earlier today to have you steal passwords out of accounts with modern browsers on 2016, and they have finally fixed that to where they, they're not in plain text in RAM anymore. 
so here's how you lower the RAM with a BCD edit command. Do a couple of these and you can create a limitation of I think 512 megs of RAM, which is very little, but it will run and it makes the memory smaller. And theoretically, I've got my machine set that way. Let me take a look. If I go to system in control panel, it will then tell me that right now I have, it says I have installed four gigs, but I don't think they're all available. Anyway, so I think I'm set correctly. I'm going to remove this old memory dump, which was five gigs and therefore annoying me. And um, okay, so the first thing is to create some evidence to see. And uh, what I did here, you have to download FTK Imager Lite. This has been, not, hasn't changed since 2010. This is a general tool free for use that will take the RAM image off a machine. And there are many other ways to do it, but this is the most common way to do it on Windows. It's been a free tool around forever. And so uh, then I put some credit card numbers in Notepad and your email address in Notepad to find some stuff to look for later. So let me do that. Um, oh, I wanted to go to certain websites. And I think that's actually the most important. Let's go to these three websites. And so looks like I've already done that. I've been to those websites and I actually went and hunted down some fake credit card numbers to use. It took me several tries to find a website that would really give me a bunch of these. These things are not intended for crime. These things are intended to test uh, payment systems because credit card numbers have a checksum. Like the last two digits are mathematically related to the others. So you often need to create a bunch of these to test things. And so you've got them there and I put them in Notepad and I put an email address or fake email address in Notepad just so this information is in RAM. And then I executed some command line commands and I'll do them again here. Um, these were pretty exciting in the old version. Now here you don't see them in plain text, but we might see them when we get up to Memorize. Memorize can actually retrieve command line commands, but they're not just sitting in RAM the way they used to be. Um, and so here, these are commands that create user accounts with passwords. So net user, uh, let me make my font bigger. Properties, font, bigger. It's really Looks like dirt still. Let's see if I can make it bold font. Do I have a bold option? I do. All right. That's probably as readable as I can make it. So I'm going to do net user Waldo and then a password of Apple one, two, three, and then slash add. That will create that account. All right. It already exists because I've already done this. And then I had one where I net make one with your name on it. And I'm going to execute it anyway, even though it's not going to run, because I want, I think it's going to go into RAM as a command issued at the command line. And that's what I care about. The fact that it fails does not mean that it can bypass putting it in RAM in order to send it to be processed. So again, this one completed successfully. Your name, super secret, add. So this is usernames and passwords in the command line. And now that's in the RAM on this machine. So all that information is there. And now we can take a RAM image. And we'll see what I get. And we'll see how big it is. If I have succeeded in preparing correctly, this will be relatively small. If not, it will be four gigabytes in size. Either one will do for what I'm doing tonight. So this is FTK Imager. And in FTK Imager, you can do certain data collection things. This is the business model of FTK. Like Adobe, it's a reader free, but the writer you pay money for. FTK makes the evidence collecting tool free. So your people that are in the field going to the crime machine, grabbing evidence, can easily use the tool. But the analysis tool is expensive. That's their business model. So um, this, I can capture memory right there. And it will give me a few options. But from there, I'm content with just the default to get the default memory capture. All I have to do is tell it to put it somewhere, like the desktop. And I could give it a name, but memdump.mem is a good enough name. So now I just hit capture memory, and off it goes. And it looks like I'm still getting five gigabytes, so I have to restart my machine to, into the other mode to get the low memory. I'll do that later. This will do for what I'm doing tonight. But it demonstrates why I don't, this is sort of annoying. It's kind of slow to grab five gigs. And by the way, I only have four gigs of RAM. I don't know why it's grabbing five gigs. Some, something's a little wrong here. Yeah, I know it about that. There is an option to get like the hyper file, but it's not getting it. Anyway, maybe you get in page file, but the page file would be bigger. Anyway, um, this will do, but uh, I'm going to do it again. And your instructions will have you doing it in a half gig of RAM, which will make the file much smaller. 
which is going to help a lot when you try to move it over to Linux to analyze it. Because uh, if you drag it and drop it on Linux, you're using VMware tools, and VMware tools are very, very inefficient and tend to crash. And Unless you put it in a virtual hard disk. Yes, if you put it in a virtual hard disk, or for that matter, a real USB is the way to move it over. But if it's half a gig, you can succeed by just trying three or four times with VMware tools. Five gigs is kind of beyond the capacity of VMware tools on most of the computers I see. Uh, VMware tools is a fantastically buggy product, and VMware networking is fantastically buggy, and this is part of what's making me think we should just go to the cloud and quit using this punk amateur stuff that doesn't work. Because you have to put a lot of work in making it go, and you're not gaining from that. So anyway, 100%, good. So we got the RAM. So this isn't too bad. It took maybe one minute to do that, but it'll be a lot faster when I get the memory cut. I said closed, didn't I? Yeah, OK. So get rid of that. And now you will see on the desktop, uh, I don't need to save this. There's the file, memdump.mem. So I want to analyze this file. Now, we're going to use a lot of different tools to analyze this file. But today, we're going to use just a simple hex editor, HXD, um, which should be installed. I thought I already installed it on this machine. I seem to be having th things fall off the bus. Let me see if I can find programs. Uh, really not there. There it is, right there. It's telling me I can't find it. <laughs> this is Microsoft. Bad. By the way, this has been this way since Windows XP. Microsoft can't make a search engine that can search your own start menu. That's why when they said they were going to make a better search engine than Google, the world laughed, and they haven't stopped laughing yet. <laughs> anyway, um, so, all right. So here I am, desktop, memdump.mem. It opens right up, which is pretty awesome. OK, so this is just the old-fashioned product. I'm just seeing the contents of the file in raw hex. This has been around forever since the days of Norton Disk Editor from decades ago. This is the simplest way to analyze stuff. And you can search for things here. So I can search for, say, samsclass.info, which is one of the URL we went to. And we'll see if we find it. And it does find it. So it is there. I don't know what all this junk is. But um, it does find the URL. And so there's some information there about having been there. And when I tried to find the net user commands, I did not find it. I found it in earlier versions of Windows, but the net user commands are no longer stored in plain text. One issue, by the way, which is why it's good to use this tool, is that many, most text strings in Windows are stored in Unicode, not ASCII. So you need to use a smart tool that can do that. And this tool can search for things in Unicode and ASCII. So I did use the command net user. And if I search everywhere for that, um, it found it. Ah, there it is, net user administer slash full name. It didn't find the actual command, but it found something that contained net user. And I can repeat the search with search find again, which is F3. So let me just hit F3. And there's another one, net user test user add. And this is not a command I executed. This is some kind of help page, giving the syntax of the command. Kind of what? Some kind of help page of how you do it. This is net user administrator activate user, no net user. It looks like some kind of help page about net user was somewhere. And that's why you really have to watch it. You will find things in RAM, and it does not mean that it was put there by the bad guy you're investigating necessarily, not at all. There's another net user and another net user. Net user, wow, look at those things. Those look like names and passwords, but I don't think they are. It's cyber crew D decrypted. You know, I wonder if this is some kind of malicious hacker page or something. It's hard to say. It could very well be some hacking tool I installed a year ago that's still sitting in this image. Um, net user guest, net user directory, and I think now it's not finding the line anymore. F3. Well, there's still more. There's net user administrator full name. Lots and lots of them here, but I think you'll find that none of them actually have my password in it. So anyway, that's... um. That's, we're going to use other tools later, but that's as far as I wanted to go today, and you can do that project there. I also managed to get an extra credit project related here. This was fun. Snowden's password. <laughs> so once we're going to use this, and then we're going to use some, some Linux tools. So we're just using a plain hex editor here to analyze it in Windows. Then we're going to use Bulk Extractor, which is a very easy, friendly Linux tool. And then we're going to use Volatility, which is a really powerful, more complicated tool. And then 
Um, but you might as well steal Snowden's password here. I made a Twitter account for Snowden, and they let me do it. I don't know why. I thought every version of Snowden's name would already be out there, but I made a real Twitter account for Ed Snowden 5, and I logged in in my virtual machine and collected the RAM, and there it is. You can download this image, and you can steal his password and get points for it with these techniques. So give it a shot. There are no instructions. That's the point of the extra credit. But anyway, it should be kind of fun, and I'll keep those coming. So after the show, my plan is there should be a project with all the steps, and then there should be a challenge with no steps, so you can practice again. That's the best way to learn, like the CTFs. All right, any questions about anything? Well, I'll clean up and go over to the lab. I'll open Science 214 for a while and see if anybody wants to go there. And uh, probably by next week, we'll have the regular hours posted. I have a couple of volunteers already, and we'll probably get more regular hours over there. So go to the job fair. But so that's in a couple of weeks.